rush hour traffic, deadlines, overtime, client calls, bills, and that surmounting pile of paperwork. Eight hours a day, five days a week. Sometimes the fast-paced hustle and bustle feels rather overwhelming, suffocating even. As my mind wandered and I began to daydream about disappearing and taking that hard-earned trip far, far away from my daily life in the urban jungle, I made a decision. I'll be gone for the weekend. And I mean gone, alright? Destination Zamboanga City. Talk about a spontaneous trip. I had about 24 hours to book my flight and if I wanted to be in Zamboanga by tomorrow morning, I would have to take the 4.50 a.m. flight via Philippine Airlines. And Zamboanga it was for several reasons, the obvious of which is to get as far as possible from the urban jungle. Another is to visit some of my good friends that live there. Stories about their delicious food, diverse culture, shopping adventures, and relaxing beach trips have drawn me in, alright? I was definitely game to see all this for myself. Last but not the least, nothing beats experiencing the heart and soul of every place. Food. In this case, I knew I was definitely in for a feast. After a couple of hours waiting, I finally heard my flight number. As I made my way to the plane, I felt a ripple of excitement, of anticipation as one is about to explore a new place for the first time. We reached Zamboanga at around 6.20 in the morning, and I was more than ready to jump out and start exploring. As I descended from the plane, I was greeted by a large banner saying, Bienvenido Zambonga, Asia's Latin city. This tweaked my curiosity as I wondered about the range of Spanish influence in their culture, aside from their dialect. Nicknamed as the City of Flowers, the city of Zamboanga is in the southernmost tip of the Zamboanga Peninsula and within the southwestern Mindanao region. According to my quick research, the city has a naturally mild climate and is rarely affected by typhoons because it is located outside the typhoon belt. That also means perfect weather to hit the beach. But first, I had to find a place to check in my entire luggage, get some rest, and recharge before I start any exploration. My friends say the Garden Orchid Hotel would perhaps be the best choice being just a few breaths away from the airport. And they weren't kidding. After just a few turns on the road, we reached the hotel. Check-in was quick and easy. All rooms come with standard air conditioning with individual thermostat control, a mini bar, cable TV, piped in music, telephone, private toilet and bath, and 24-hour room service. It was around 7 in the morning and I wanted a quick bite before meeting my friend Kara in the hotel lobby. The Garden Orchid has five dining facilities to choose from. The cafe, which is the main hotel restaurant right by the lobby. The lobby bar is suitable for unwinding with a drink after a meal or for a good nightcap while the Baron is for the more quiet and intimate a la carte dining. There is also a Japanese restaurant below the hotel called Hanazono Japanese Restaurant. And if you're in the mood to party but too lazy to leave the hotel, just head over to Ground Zero and party the night away. After a quick bite, I met with my friend Kara the Zambongenia at the hotel lobby. 
I had told her that the first thing I wanted to do was to hit the beach or if possible, as many beaches in Zamboanga. So she promised to take me to her favorite beach, which was the Great Santa Cruz Island, also known as the Pink Sand Beach. Pink Sand Beach? I was more than excited to find out why it was called such. Santa Cruz Island can be reached in 15 to 20 minutes from either the Lantaco Hotel or the golf course for less than 6 US dollars round trip aboard a small boat that can carry 4 to 5 persons. We passed several little islands on the way, including the smaller Santa Cruz Island, and Kara told me we were definitely near. I couldn't wait to jump off the boat and just frolic in the sand and bask under the sun. A couple of dogs greeted us, indicating that the beach wasn't deserted like I first thought. As I took a closer look at the sand, I did notice that it had pink bits mixed with the whitish sand. I wondered though where this pink stuff came from. Hey Kara, thanks a lot for bringing me here. I've been really wanting to go to the beach for quite a while because I've been really, really stressed. It's called Pink, pink, pink Sand Beach. Well, why is that? Yeah, look at this. That's why it's called Pink Sand because the coral, crushed corals, mixed into the, mixed sand. Into the sand. Wow. That's about 300 miles of this unique coral and sand fusion. After spending some time relaxing and swimming, we headed on to the sandbank we spotted earlier. Visible from afar at low tide, this long narrow stretch of sand sits right in the middle of nothing but water. After a while though, all that beach combing made me hungry. Again. I turned to my Amiga for some culinary recommendations. Baked and tired with ravenous appetites, we went straight to Alavar's seafood house on Don Alfaro Street in Tetuan. Immediately, we were greeted by Leo, the restaurant chef. He probably noticed the look of hunger on our faces. Or perhaps he had a special ability of spotting food lovers. Whatever it was, he was definitely helpful in showing us Alavar's specialty. Each dish looked absolutely mouth-watering. I grabbed a plate, filled it with pretty much of everything and ate to my heart's delight. I absolutely enjoyed each and every dish. But the winners in this feast were definitely the green mango with Alavar's trademark shrimp paste or bago, and of course the curacha in its special sauce. Talk about indulging in gluttonous ecstasy! To aid in digestion, we decided to walk around and check out the restaurant grounds. You think that was the end of it? Of course not! On the subject of food, Kara was telling me about the dishes typically found in Zamboanga City. One caught my attention and I was very curious to taste it. This was the sati a type of halal food very common to Muslims and locals in Zamboanga. She described it as spicy, good for hangovers, and can easily be found in the streets. This awakened my taste buds once more and I set out for yet another gastronomical adventure. The sati is small chunks of grilled beef on a stick, like a mini kebab, served with puso, which is rice steamed within woven coconut leaves. In a bowl, the stuff is smothered in sambal, a sweet and spicy curry sauce. This is sipped like thick soup. The lady explained that this dish is known to cure any degree of hangover. 
which is why night owls often flock here for a serving before heading home. After a few spoonfuls, I understood why. I was sweating profusely from the hot sauce. Perhaps it was a tinge of sweet mixed with spice, but there was something about it that would make you want to eat more. Okay, enough eating for the day! Kara said since I wanted to check out the different beaches in Zamboanga, it would be good to head over to Zamboanga Golf Course and Beach Park for a cool afternoon stroll. Picnic sheds and tables line the long stretch overlooking the beach, suitable for large groups and families. As I took a long steady walk, I noticed the calm atmosphere of the park. Tranquil, soothing. Perhaps it was a soft splash of waves upon rocks and sand, or the faint laughter of children playing along its shore. It was indeed a peaceful experience. Walking further, I reached the golf course and noticed its fine layout and winding fairways. Although the first nine is somewhat flat, the second is fairly rolling, skirting around the Basilan Strait for a bit of ocean view. The course has elevated greens, which can be tricky for their small size and rolling makeup. The course has 18 holes within 64 hectares. Along the way, I meet one of Kara's friends, Richard, who also works in the city tourism office and offered some background information on the park. I learned that this is one of the oldest golf courses in the Philippines, founded in 1910 by former American Governor John Blackjack Pershing of the Moro Province. He was also the club's first president. It was getting late and I felt like retiring early. But for dinner, I opted for Park 88 Grill and Restaurant along Pasunanka Road. As I entered, I immediately sensed the vibe emanating from the nightlife which was well and alive. Families can dine and enjoy a scrumptious meal of seafoods and grilled specialties, while party animals can quaff a few beers and enjoy the featured bands and other performances. For everyone else here, the night was still young. The next day, I woke up early and felt like going around town to see how the locals go about with their daily lives. I took a tricycle to the city proper and right smack in the center is the city hall and the Rizal Park. I got there just in time for the morning flag ceremony. It was refreshing to be in the middle of such an activity that is integral in the town's daily routine. The city hall was built in 1905 and completed two years later by the American federal government for the then American governors, which included Leonard O. Wood, Tasker H. Bliss, Ralph Hoyt, and John Pershing. Right across is the Rizal Park marked by a monument that pays tribute to the national hero. I instantly recognized several of the characters from Rizal's famous novels and ponder on the historical significance of this shrine. From the word Libertad in Rizal's two novels, it was easy for me to assume that freedom was the integral message here. About two minutes away from the city hall is Plaza Pershing, a quaint remnant of a typical Spanish square named in honor of the former American governor. This was originally called Plaza de Don Juan de Salcedo, after Spain's great conqueror. Today, town folk can come and help themselves to plants, fruits, and other food products sold in the Plaza Bazaar, usually held during the fiesta season. Another popular historical site in the city is the Fort Pilar. Fort Pilar was built in 1635 by Father Melchor de Vera, 
a Jesuit priest engineer to ward off attacks from Moros and foreign invaders. It was originally named Real Fuerza de San Jose, but later changed to Real Fuerza de Nuestra Señora del Pilar de Zaragoza, the city's patron saint after it was rebuilt in 1719 by military engineer Juan de Siscara. It enshrines the patron saint's statue, and thousands of devotees from Mindanao and other countries flock to the shrine and pay their respects. The fort includes a national museum and a patio, and has become a venue for cultural events. After going around and helping myself to Zamboanga's native food such as the durian and mangosteen, I got in the mood for more shopping. I had to buy some presents for my friends and family back in Manila, not forgetting the special requests such as woven shawls, sarongs, and durian candy. I went over to check out Zamboanga's flea market, commonly known as Ukay Ukay, in the hope of unearthing some bargain pieces. I make my way through the narrow aisles and survey the racks of shirts, pants, and shorts. Typical of flea markets found in other parts of the country, shopping here involves major haggling expertise. Lest we forget that Zamboanga is also a major trading hub of Southern Philippines and Southeast Asia, I decided to check out the popular Zamboanga barter markets. There are four barter markets in Zamboanga. BCC Shopping Center in Baliwasan, Santa Cruz Market in the Port Area, and in Canilar. These markets carry merchandise from Europe, the U.S., Indonesia, Japan, Singapore, Malaysia, Taiwan, and China. As I look around for stuff I can get for my friends and family, I find mostly textile, houseware, blankets, batik cloth, toys, imported canned goods and chocolate, toiletries, bags, and electronic items. Almost everything can be bought here. I was interested in the woven shawls and batik cloth and I looked around to compare prices. Some were priced reasonably for as little as 2 US dollars. I've always been interested in Muslim clothing and was delighted to find a stall that sold lots of it. As I looked through the colorful stacks of shawls and headdresses, I found myself learning about Muslim fashion from the friendly lady who attended to me. I have often wondered if it was acceptable for non-Muslims to also wear Muslim clothing and headdresses, known as the hijab. She replied that it was fine, since it is mere fashion and style that can also be trendy and shared. Pleased by this, I found myself with a new wardrobe and enough hijabs to start my own shop back home. But wait, I knew I was forgetting something. I could not leave Zamboanga without purchasing some pearls for my sisters back home. For less than $10, I was able to get a necklace with earrings and a bracelet. What a sweet deal! After buying the pearl set for my sister, I went on to find more of Zamboanga's treasures, something from Mother Nature herself. For my next stop, I'll be visiting another place created by former Mayor Maria Clara Lobregat. Known to be a lover of butterflies, Maria Clara Lorenzo Lobregat helped establish this ecological haven as an educational and conservation project for the city's residents. At present, the butterfly farm is home to about four endemic species, the most common of which is the swallowtail. Becky, the farm supervisor, was kind enough to offer some insight on the life cycle of butterflies. The complete cycle of uh, breeding butterflies from eggs to pupa, caterpillar, and uh, the real butterflies that you can see around. I had the privilege of releasing a butterfly that had just broken free from its cocoon. I watched it flutter away as it set flight for the first time. Like the other newly released butterflies, it hurried to the nearest flower to feed on its nectar.
Later that afternoon, I decided to visit La Vista del Mar Beach Resort, just 7 kilometers away from the city proper. As I looked around deciding what to eat, I was greeted by the resort's manager, Dito Silobregat. Upon hearing I was both hungry and curious about their food, she showed me around and into their kitchen. They were just about to cook a popular Zamboanga afternoon snack called Saging Rebosao, fried banana fritters cooked in brown sugar. I noticed there are three types of brown sugar used here. Two regular brown sugar, only varying in degree of refinement, and muscovado sugar, which is raw and unrefined. Soon, the saging rabosa was ready, and I could hardly wait to grab a piece to taste. Now I'll finally get to taste saging rabosa. It's really, really good. It's crumbly. You can taste the muscovado sugar. It's actually equivalent to the banana cube in Manila, but it has a different texture. I could probably go on and on about this dangerously addicting snack. It is quite similar to the banana cube, another Filipino afternoon snack commonly found in Manila, but differing in texture and consistency. While the banana cube is heavy, served on a stick, and thickly coated with sugary glaze, the saging rabusao is a lighter option as it is sliced like french fries and crunchy even without the glaze. As I munched on the bananas with contentment, I told Ditos how I've come to appreciate the restaurant's furnishings. She then offered the tour of the grounds and pointed out the famous tree house in the resort rooms called Casitas. Her tiny dog, Federico, joined us on our tour. I was amazed by the ingenuity that went into the house's design. Not only was it efficiently built and furnished with recycled materials, its design enabled passive cooling and allowed good air circulation throughout the house. Upstairs, the room is cozy. It is equipped with electricity, cable TV, and hot shower. Yup, we are still in a tree house, and I'd better be on my way before I give in to the temptation of setting camp here. As I told Ditos of how I would love to live in my own well-designed tree house, she gives me a quick tour of the casitas. All the casitas look very comfortable and cozy, and can accommodate 4 to 10 people. One of the charms of this resort is the lush garden surrounding the entire area. According to Ditos, these plants are indigenous and are tended regularly without any use of chemical fertilizers or pesticides. I end my tour of La Vista del Mar with a stop at the Maria Clara Art Gallery. At the entrance, Ditos calls my attention to a piece of driftwood. Upon entering the gallery, I was immediately drawn to the colorful interiors and the various artworks on display. The small gallery has an almost whimsical feel to it, without being cluttered or frivolous. Dito showed me the various items carried by the gallery, from wooden boxes to painted crosses, woven bags, quaint figurines, and beaded shoes. Some of the wooden items such as boxes, stools, and letter openers were made from used wood. A sensible practice in this resort. The gallery also recently began hosting exhibits for various artists with the hope of cultivating the art scene in Zamboanga. Poetry reading and musical gigs have also been featured here and were all open to the public. I wanted to stay and linger in the gallery but I had to go and meet Kara for dinner. I already made a mental checklist of the items I liked and hoped to buy, like bags, crosses, boxes, paintings, that chair and exhibit. Wait, I think I want to get everything! On the ride back to the hotel, I passed Climaco Street. As I looked out into the street, 
I noticed something very peculiar about the electric wires. They were filled with birds! Birds! There must have been hundreds, no, thousands of birds perched on all the electric wires in the entire stretch of Queen Mako Street. I was told that around this time of the year, thousands of birds fly to the street at dusk and sleep on the wires until dawn. Nobody knows where they come from or why they have chosen this spot. Just remember to look up and watch your shoulder each time you pass here at night. You never know what can drop in you. I said I was supposed to have dinner with Kara, right? Well, the girl is indeed full of surprises! To celebrate my last night in Zamboanga, we spent the rest of the night with her friends doing what she loves most. Singing! I felt trapped! I never sing, not even when I'm alone. But before I knew what was happening, I found myself in a room, in front of a TV screen holding a microphone. Thanks to peer pressure, I reluctantly croaked out a few lines from an old song my uncles used to sing in their own drunken stupor. But before long, Kara's energy rubbed off on me and before I knew it, I was actually singing along to not just one or two, but quite a few more songs. Hey, maybe this was not so bad after all. I actually had a great time singing, or croaking. Kara is indeed the person to hang out with if you want to have fun and be merry. Towards the end of the evening, I was seriously contemplating doing KTV when I get back in Manila. Yikes! The next day, I had to prepare for my flight back home to Manila. But there was something more I wanted to do before I take my final leave that soothing massage at Tropical Spa. Ah, this was my zen moment. As they carefully poured water into my feet, I felt all the stress and tension melting away. Relaxed and pampered, I closed my eyes and relished the moment. Before I knew it, it was time for me to go and say farewell to the City of Flowers. definitely flies when you are having fun, and I cannot believe my little weekend getaway has reached its end. Spending the past few days in Zamboanga has been quite an experience, not just as a visual and gastronomic feast. My stay may have been brief, but I felt I was able to immerse myself in their culture, making friends and building lasting relationships. Intertwined with cultural diversity and a collective yearning to concretize an identity, Zamboanga City is a reflection of our own quest for our true selves. Adios Zamboanga Hermosa! Till we meet again! <laughs>